Let's talk to Mark Oswald. He's a strategist at ADMISI. Very good morning to you, young good Mark. Good morning. Right, as always, thoughts provoking finish to the week. You've yep. sent four slides this week. Yep. Let's kick off without further ado on the first one. Yes, um, uh, a mixture here. Uh, I think sometimes the lip of fund flows data gets um, uh, overlooked and it's really wor worthwhile having a look at this one this week because yes, we saw some inflows into credit um, above all investment grade. Um, 3.07 billion is sizable for a weekly. Okay. We're still seeing outflows from high yield. However, uh, the big inflows this week were into equity funds, 10 billion. Um, that's very big for any week. Um, one big contrast to what we've been seeing over the past year, and this is sort of part of the theme for today, and that is if you have a look at the two lines below all equity funds, we've got a 9.1 billion inflow into domestic equities and uh, just a 976 million inflow into non domestic equity funds. Now, over the past year, for particularly during the period when the dollar was weak, most of the money which was being allocated to the equity market was either being allocated to uh, Europe, to Asia, or to EM in general in, on the equity front. And yep. there wasn't much enthusiasm for uh, the S&P or the Dow or, or anything else. But obviously this week, uh, seeing strong inflows probably explains to us why uh, the Russell 2000 is at a record high as well. But it does, and that's a small cap index, right? That's so a small domestic, cap index, domestic. and you would expect it to benefit from you know strong inflows into domestic okay. funds. Um, not completely seeing a disaster on the EM front. Um, if one has a look at local currency debt funds, marginal inflow, um, hard currency um, EM, yeah, bit of an inflow there. Um, <clears throat> um, but overall, it really emphasizes that we are seeing a shift prompted by the strengthening of the dollar. So if we move on to the next uh, table, um, the strength of the dollar. Yeah, well, this, this is um, a, a, my proprietary table, sort of, uh, it's an unweighted average of performances right. of all the, all the currencies that people typically look at versus the dollar, the euro, and the, the yen. Um, on the week, which is the second column, uh, it's not actually huge. The the biggest, you know, the, the, there are a couple of black sheep in there. The Turkish lira, which we've highlighted many a time, uh, now over the past five to six weeks, still very much under pressure. But a lot of uh, pressure also emerging in Latin America, Argentine peso, Brazilian real, um, and indeed the Uruguayan new peso. Uh, Quick shout out on this one, obviously, is the one currency which hasn't done too badly in the M space this week is the Russian ruble. And certainly the bond market's seen plenty of inflows and there's a realisation that uh, for all the problems that Russia has, and then undeniable, it still really doesn't have a lot of foreign currency exposure. It needs the foreign investment into Russia, but ultimately, if we're in a bit of an EM scare scenario, Russia, for choice, is actually a safe haven within the EM space. And this has been seen time and time again over many, many years. So well, well worth bearing in mind. Um, now, let's move on to something which I find really quite amusing, because you could misinterpret this chart with a vengeance. It's basically comparing the performance of the FTSE 100 with the performance of cable. Now, is the performance of the FTSE 100 telling us that actually foreign investors and indeed domestic investors think that UK PLC is looking very undervalued at the moment? Um, I doubt it. Um, if you wanted to measure that, you wouldn't actually be looking at the FTSE 100. You'd be looking at the FTSE 250. Really, what this is telling us is that um, a sharp decline in the pound against the dollar is always very, very beneficial. One only has to look at the big moves on that chart to see that every time either you get a sharp appreciation in the, uh, the pound or sharp depreciation in the pound, it has an immediate feed through into the FTSE 100. So a lot of this is a currency play. Obviously, the FTSE is actually on that scaling, looking like it's um, outperforming the, the sterling. And that's also to do with the other fact that the FTSE 100 is primarily a resource index. Yeah. So oil, miners. All priced uh, in dollars. So um, one should take this um, really as a reminder that this is more about the dollar than it is about anything to the UK or to do with politics, to do with the economy, 
anything at all. It's really just completely divorced from that. Uh, I just thought it was a point worth making. Very good. Um, <clears throat> and finally, uh, let's go back to the bets noir of the week, um, which we mentioned, we talked about a little bit last week. We're getting um, <clears throat> a little bit more colour on what the new um, Five Star Movement Lega uh, coalition government wants to do. Um, and we've seen a lot of people talking about how the um, spread between German Bunds and Italian BTPs has widened dramatically. And I think the, the point I wanted to make here, first of all, is the 10-year BTP yield at the moment is 2.1. Um, yep, it's, it's a lot higher than it was. Um, but let's also recall, back at the height of the Eurozone crisis, two-year yields in Italy were close to 8% and 10-year yields close to 7 2% really doesn't cut too much with me. Um, Secondly, in terms of this dramatic widening in, uh, in the rate differential between the two, what dramatic widening? Basically, we're in the middle of the range that we've seen for the past year. Well, I would call that the low end of the range. Well, <laughs> if, for choice, actually, the low end of the range, though clearly the spread tightening trend that's evident in that chart has gone. Yeah. That, that particular trend has gone. Um, I think there's plenty. I, I would say, actually, what it says is there's a good deal of complacency still around. Part of it obviously predicated on the fact that the ECB is still buying. Part of it predicated, I think, on the assumption, um, though I'm not sure that it's a safe one, is we've had numerous governments in Italy over the years. Um, and at the end of the day, the mandarins in the Italian Treasury and in the civil service always get knuckle, uh, governments to knuckle down and get with the program. Um, <clears throat> I think this is going to be more difficult, and there's a, a big risk here that we there's no good reason why we shouldn't revisit that high in the spread from last year. Um, the program, above all, highlights that just for um, instituting this universal basic income of 740 lira, um, lira. oh, what a pofar, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, uh, uh, euros a month and um, raising, ensuring that everyone has a pension of 780 is going to cost 17 billion euros a year. You know, when we're looking at some of the other measures that they're talking about, you're talking about maybe uh, an increase in, in, in Italian government debt instantly of something in the region of 70 to 80 billion, the budget deficit going to something like 4.5%, which wouldn't be considered good anywhere. So there's still quite a lot of a complacency here, and I still think it is actually a substantial risk. It obviously is also a big, big hurdle, as I've said before, to any idea that we could get closer Eurozone economic integration. On that note, young Mark, thank you very much indeed.